Well, you guys know uh, the challenges Wendy and I have faced over the last year and relaunching this work. And um, one of the pastors that I've known for years and, and gotten a little closer to, um, Pastor Sandy Adams from Stone Mountain, Georgia. Uh, Sandy started Stone Mountain Calvary Chapel 22 years old, 37 years ago. A little Bible study and now uh, a beacon there uh, in Georgia where they are all these years, and he continues his ministry. He's one of the friends that really God used to encourage me and Wendy. Yeah, guys like Malcolm Wilde and Joe Foch and all these guys who are really uh, family in the Calvary movement. And so some time ago, after we relaunched, uh, I asked Sandy if he would consider coming. He brought Allie and Matt from Stone Mountain to lead worship. So thanks to Matt and Allie for coming to lead worship. And Pastor Sandy is here. Please welcome Pastor Sandy Adams. God bless you. Love you, man. Good morning, Calvary Chapel. It's so good to be here with you. Uh, it's a joy to be here and to experience firsthand a fresh new work of the Lord here in St. Petersburg, and it's just a blessing to be here and to be a part of it. It's also great to see God putting some fresh wind in the sails of our friends, Pastor Danny and Wendy. Uh, I have never seen them more excited about ministry than I'm, I'm watching right now, and God is just doing great things uh, here, and we're just delighted to be with you today. You know, uh, I think it was your first meeting when you met under the pavilion in that park somewhere. You know, you remember? The, I watched that video, and like in the beginning, there was like five or six people there, and then the people just started coming and coming and growing and growing and swelling and swelling. And I'm thinking, well, first of all, I'm thinking, man, I'm getting car sick. Whoever shot that video is just going in and out. <laughs> but then I'm watching it, and I'm saying, how exciting is this? You know, God does work in mysterious ways, does he not? You know, Calvary Chapel is a big family. And like all families, we sometimes have our problems. But we're in a family that understands God's grace. And we realize that it's through our weaknesses and often our tragedies that God does his greatest miracles. It's amazing. And I believe God has great things in store for this church. And I'm praying for you, and I'm watching with great expectancy as how he's going to pour out his grace on this fellowship. So it's good to be here. Well, you know, this week is Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday of the year. Here's what's going to happen at my house this Thursday morning. First of all, my wife's going to jump out of bed, probably wearing her apron. <laughs> and she's going to head to the kitchen, and she's going to go to work on a masterpiece. My oldest son, he's in charge of frying the turkey. We like to fry our turkey. Mmm, it's good. He's going to fry the turkey. And then my four kids and their spouses, they're going to come over to our house. They're going to get there about 10 o'clock, and they're going to bring with them. I don't care where they come or not, but they need to bring with them my eight grandkids. Yes. And catch this. My eight grandkids are all five years old and under. We've got two five-year-olds. Two four-year-olds, a three-year-old, a two-year-old, a one-year-old, and a newborn. Can you imagine? And suddenly, our empty nest is going to become a beehive of activity. And my job, I'm G-Daddy. That's what they call me. I'm G-Daddy. And G-Daddy's job is to occupy the kids and to make it fun for them to come over to the house. And so Kathy said, I don't care how you do it. Just, just make sure you occupy the kids. You'll have a couple hours and, and, and make sure they have a good time. So I've been thinking about it and thinking about it. So here's what I'm going to do. I've hired two ponies. <laughs> I'm bringing in ponies. 
and we're going to have pony rides all morning long, feed them sugar cubes and apple slices, and we're going to have a great time. That's going to be what's going to happen Thursday at our house. It's going to be fun. But here's the deal. We can do all of that, all of that, and still miss the point of Thanksgiving. Because Thanksgiving is not about us. It's about us saying thanks to God. And here's what I want to talk to you about this morning. I want to answer the question, how do we say thanks to God? You know, the Bible gives us some instructions. You can turn to them in Psalm 116. The 116th Psalm, the title of my message, How to Say Thanks to God. While you're turning there, let me pray and ask for God's blessing on our Bible study this morning. Father, thank you for these folks who've come with open hearts, with ready minds to worship you, to hear from you through your word. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us today. Lord, that you would do a profound work in our hearts. Lord, we're embarking on a season here that should be just for us, just for Christians. Because we have much, much, much for which to be thankful. Teach us, Lord, how we can say thanks to you in ways that please you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in Psalm 116, verse 12, the psalmist asks this question. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? And then he answers his question. I will take up the cup of salvation... And call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Famous pastor and Bible teacher Matthew Henry was once robbed on his way to a meeting. Well, the next day he wrote of his experience in his diary. He said, let me be thankful. First, because I was never robbed before. Second, Because although they took my wallet, they didn't take my life. Third, because although they took my all, it was not much. And then fourth, because it was I who was robbed, not I who robbed. Now how's that for looking on the bright side? No matter how grim and gloomy our circumstances are today, If we look hard enough, we all can find a reason for which to be thankful. It's been said, if we pause to think, we'll have cause to thank. If you're having trouble this morning finding a few reasons for which to be grateful, i got a few suggestions for you. First, if you can't pay your bills, just be thankful you're not one of your creditors. You can be thankful that only you and God have all the facts about yourself. Even though we haven't gotten all we want, we can be thankful we haven't gotten what we deserve. If you can't be thankful for what you've received, you can at least be thankful for what you've escaped. And lastly, we can all be thankful for many blinds. Because if it wasn't for many blinds, it'd be curtains for all of us. Once there was a teacher, she uh, asked her fourth grade students to name one thing for which they were thankful. Most of the kids listed their pets and their parents and their possessions, but one little boy responded, I'm thankful for my glasses because they keep me out of a lot of trouble. Well, the teacher was perplexed by that, that answer. She asked the little guy, she said, now how do your glasses keep you out of trouble? The little boy told her, he said, they keep the boys from beating me up and the girls from kissing me. Hey, we all should have the attitude of gratitude. And this is especially true for us who are Americans. Oh, if you've traveled abroad, you realize that most Americans scrape off their plate after the meal and send down the garbage disposal. What would be considered by three-fifths of this world to be a feast fit for a king. When President Calvin Coolidge issued his Thanksgiving Day proclamation, he said this, We have been a most favored people. We ought to be a most thankful people. We live in a country that has been blessed by God. Americans have much for which to be thankful. 
And if that's true for Americans, it is especially true for those of us who are Christians. For of all the people in the world, none should be more thankful than those of us who follow Jesus, folks who have tasted of God's wonderful and amazing grace. It's been said, the term gratitude, it's from the root word grace. Gratitude is our response to amazing grace. As God has been gracious to us, we should be grateful to him. Think of all God has done for us. He spared not his only son. He's given us life, new and never-ending, full and free, holy and happy. Add to that a complete pardon, a new birth, an abounding love, a steadying peace, the presence of his spirit, a supernatural strength, special gifts and callings, brothers and sisters in Christ, to top it all off, a home in heaven. Wow. With all that God has done for us, the least we can do is to be thankful. Bible commentator William Hislop, he once wrote, To save such a sinner as I, God shall never hear the end of it. That should be our sentiment as well. My mom believed in writing thank you notes. When we got a gift, she expected us to take the time to sit down and pin a thank you. I hated it. I'd rather be outside dribbling a basketball or riding my bike. Most of the time, I'd already said thanks anyway. I figured that was enough, but not for mom. She believed you weren't really thankful unless you had taken the time and made the effort to express your gratitude in a tangible way. Now, if I ask you, are you thankful for all that God has done for you? I'm sure 99% of you would reply, of course I'm thankful. Who isn't thankful? God is so good. But have you been thankful enough to express your thanks? I heard the courageous yet tragic story of a man named Edward Spencer. Ned was a Bible college student strolling along the shores of Lake Michigan one day when he saw a boat full of passengers. They were sinking in cold, choppy waters. With no consideration for his own safety, Ned bravely dove into the icy waters. He swam into the lake, back and forth to the shore, a total of 16 times that day, rescuing 17 people. After everyone was safe, Ned collapsed from exhaustion on the bank. He never fully recovered from his heroic heroic ordeal. Complications set in that stunted his health. It kept Ned from pursuing the full-time ministry for which he was preparing. But to make matters worse, not one of the 17 people Ned Spencer plucked from Lake Michigan that day ever returned and found him and said thanks. I'm sure if you had tracked down each person, I'm sure they would have said that they were grateful. But no one bothered to express their gratitude to Ned. Hey, Jesus has made a far greater sacrifice for us than Ned Spencer did in rescuing those people from the lake. Jesus has rescued us from the lake of fire. But have we taken the time and made the effort to say thanks? In Luke 17, Jesus entered a certain village, and he met ten lepers who were crying out for mercy. He healed all ten lepers, and as soon as he did, they all raced off to the priest to be pronounced clean and to begin their new lives. Only one man bothered to return and thank Jesus for the miracle. That's when Jesus asked, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Today, millions the world over have been recipients of the grace and mercy and cleansing of our Lord Jesus. But we can still hear him ask, Didn't I heal Jim and Jill? Save Andy and Ashley comfort? Beverly and Becky, but where are they? And here's my question for us this morning. Are we among the nine, nowhere to be found? Or are you and I among the few who've taken the time to say thanks? On the bus one day, a a man gave up his seat to a woman. His act of courtesy so shocked the lady she fainted. She wasn't used to gracious men. Well, when the lady was finally revived, she thanked the man for giving her her, her seat, his seat. 
Her gratitude, gratitude so shocked him, he fainted. Neither one of them were used to gracious and grateful people, and they were shocked by their expressions. I wonder if God would be shocked if today you and I stopped our complaining about our spouse and our job and our kids and our neighbors and simply took the time and made the effort to say thanks to God for all the many blessings He has lavished upon us. Well, here in Psalm 116, the psalmist tells us how to say thanks to God. Verse 12 asks the question, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? In other words, what does God prefer in the way of a thank you? Does God want a thank you note? A little card from you? Some candy and flowers? I mean, how do you show the almighty God that you are thankful for his benefits? If I'm going to put the time in, if I'm going to make the effort in expressing my thanks, then surely I want to express my gratitude in a way that's going to please the Lord. Well, this morning's text supplies us with three ways to say thanks to God. He says, first, take up the cup of salvation. Second, call upon the name of the Lord. And then third, pay your vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Let's take a closer look at the 116th Psalm and learn how to say thanks to God. To me, verse 13 offers a truly strange means of expressing our thanks. Remember the psalmist, remember his answer is, I will take up the cup of salvation. But recall the question, what shall I render, or that is give to God for all his benefits? Here he tells us to give by taking. That's strange. I give to God by taking from Him? It really does sound strange until I think it through. For what can I really give to God that He doesn't already possess? Think about it. God is the one person on earth who really does need nothing. You know, there are folks on my Christmas card list this year that are difficult to buy for because they already own everything I can afford to give them. And this is true with God. In Acts chapter 17, verse 24, Paul said to the Athenians, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. The one true God is in need of nada. He possesses all things. Remember Psalm 50 says God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Our scrawny sacrifices don't impress him much. I was at a Christmas party one time when someone suggested we go around the room and everyone talk about what they were going to give to God that year for Christmas. Well, most of us talked about giving God more of our time or money or energy. Then came my friend's turn. He shocked a group by announcing that he had nothing to give to God that year. When someone asked him why, he said, because God already owns everything I've got. Realize true gratitude begins with a frustration. God has given us so much, yet there's nothing really that we can give to Him. You see, all we can do is take what He's given and allow it to accomplish its intended purpose in our lives. We thank God for His blessings when we enjoy them to the fullest. If we want to say thanks to God, then take up the goblet of grace, grab that mug of mercy, put it to your lips, and take a deep, long drink. The cup of salvation brims with blessing. It's heavy with heaven. You remember David was speaking of this cup in the shepherd's psalm, Psalm 23. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Savor every single drop of God's blessing. If you want to say thanks to God, you do so by taking advantage of his many and marvelous gifts. Think of it. God journeyed from the heights of heaven to the depths of this earth. From the crib to the cross. From a cold, dark tomb to a throne in heaven just to bring you and I blessings untold. The least we can do is open up our hearts and receive his goodness toward us. Try to compensate God for his gifts and you only devalue them. 
Hey, if you could earn God's blessing, it would only cheapen the price God paid to acquire them. As the poet put it, the best return for one like me, so wretched to the core, is from God's gifts to draw a plea and ask him still for more. If you want to say thanks to God for his grace, then ask him for more. Turn up that cup of salvation and keep on drinking. My grandma was a southern gourmet. Grandma Adams could whip up a scrumptious meal in the blink of an eye. Black-eyed peas, cornbread, hot buttered grits, collard greens, fried okra, biscuits and gravy, fried chicken, country smoked ham. Am I making you hungry? Hope so. All the extras. If you're not a native southerner, you might not be impressed by what I've just mentioned, but trust me. If you could have sampled some of my grandma's cooking, you'd be an admirer. She was amazing. Whenever a visitor came to her house, no matter the time of day, she'd start dinner. And before you knew it, you'd been invited to her table. She could serve up a banquet fit for a king. And she would take nothing for it. If you tried to pay her, she'd be insulted. The only way you could say thanks to my grandma was to clean your plate. (laughs) My grandma's reward for cooking was the joy of seeing somebody scarf up her vittles and come roaring back for more. The greatest insult you could give her would be to nibble a little bit and then push your plate aside as if you didn't like it. And this is the way it is with God's blessing. When we clean our plate and ask for more, we say thanks to God. But when we don't have time to eat, or when we fill up on other stuff, that's when we break God's heart. We insult God when we consume junk food, when we feed on the garbage that this world offers, and that we don't bring our appetites to Him. Here's a great quote. This is the height of all madness. This is the lowest depth of all sin. God spares not His own Son, and we stand with our hands folded against our chest. Hey, you say thanks to God by reaching out and grabbing every single blessing that his blood has paid for. Turn up the cup of salvation and savor every single drop. Don't you waste an ounce of God's grace. Well, here's a second way to say thanks to God. Notice again verse 13. We're told to call on the name of the Lord. When trouble strikes, when a need arises, we say thanks to God By calling on him for help. Now again, this sounds like a selfish way to express our thanks. You think we would do for God rather than ask God to do for us. But again, what can we really do for God that he can't do a better job of himself? I mean, when a dad involves his toddlers in a project, he's not doing it because he needs a kid's help. If anything, his children are only going to slow him down, get in his way. No, dad gets his toddler to, quote, help him because he enjoys a child's company. And in the process of it, he wants to teach him a few tasks, a few skills. And this is why God involves us in his work. God doesn't need you and me. When we serve God, we're not doing God a favor. God is doing us a favor. Hey, we say thanks to God, not by helping him, but by asking for his help. You know, when my kids were younger and got into trouble, they they didn't turn to the yellow pages for the nearest Ph.D. They they didn't canvas the university for an expert in the field. They didn't even dial 911. When those kids had a problem, they called D.A.D. They ran to Dad, and they expected me to step in and salvage the situation and have a solution. And you know what? I wouldn't have wanted it any other way. Nothing flatters a father more than when his child turns instinctively to him for help. And the same is true with God. If you really want to say thanks to God, make him your first retreat in times of trouble, not your last resort. Let me give you another illustration. What if you find an automobile mechanic? He does great work. He's fair, he's honest, he's efficient. Well, how do you say thanks to that mechanic? Send him a thank you note? A pick-me-up bouquet? 
No way. Try that with a macho mechanic. He might just punch you in the nose. What that mechanic wants most is your return business. The next time your car breaks down, if you look up another mechanic, he'll assume you weren't satisfied with his service. But if he's the first person you call with your car, that mechanic knows that you appreciate his work. Let me ask you guys, when you're sick, what's your first reaction? Do you take an aspirin? Call the doctor? Or do you pray? Do you run to God for his intervention, for his healing help? When you're lonely, what's your first response? Call a friend? Take in a movie? Visit a bar? Or do you open up your Bible, get on your knees, and renew your fellowship with God? When business dips, what's your first remedy? Increase marketing? Downsize the labor force? Hire a consultant? Or do you get on your knees and trust God for his blessing? And when you're tired and weary, where do you seek rest? Do you turn on the television and veg out? Plan a vacation? Or do you ask God for his peace? You see, the psalmist tells us that we say thanks to God by calling on the name of the Lord. For many years, my kids, as they worked their way through college, they would call on me to proofread their English composition papers. First it was Natalie, then it was Nick, then it was Mac. They figured out that having an author in the family made it kind of nice. They could just go to Dad and have Dad review their papers before they turned turn them in. And so they would email me their paper at 10 o'clock on the night before it was due the next morning. And I would usually mumble and grumble something like, well, what do these kids expect of me? Do they think I'm going to just drop what I'm doing and just work on their papers at a moment's notice? You know, that's what I said, but that's not how I felt. I was really glad they wanted my help. In fact, I would have been insulted had they ever stopped. The only time reviewing their papers bothered me was when we got back a grade of C from the teacher. I'd get angry. How did I get a C on that composition paper? But when my kids ran to me for help, I felt loved and trusted and appreciated. I'm glad they wanted my input. And this is how God feels when we call on him. Did you, did you hear about the couple that got married at the travel agency? Turns out she was looking for a getaway, and he was her last resort. Is the Lord your last resort, or is he your first retreat? You say thanks to God by calling on the name of the Lord. And then the third way the psalmist tells us that we can say thanks to God is to pay your vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. The writer of the 116th Psalm, he was so thankful to God that he would take his little lamb, it was the pick of the litter, and he would parade his sacrifice through the streets of Jerusalem without regard to the opinions of other people, simply overwhelmed with his love and enthusiasm for God. The psalmist would go up to the temple and he would offer his sacrifice openly and publicly before the community. And if we're truly thankful to God, we too will go public with our praise. You know, Jesus told us that when we pray, we need to go into our closet and we need to close the door behind us. Prayer is a private act. But when we praise God, we need to roll down the windows, friend. Whisper your prayers, but shout out your praise. Shout it so all can hear. Psalm 107 verse 2 says it clearly. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. We live in a day when every blasphemous, godless, evil imaginable gets drug out into the light of day and paraded across our television screens. People flaunt their sacrilege and spew their irreverence. There's no shame anymore. It's about time that we who are grateful to God grew just as bold and just as vocal with our praise. Woo! Let's stop acting as if we're ashamed of God. Let's go out into our marketplace and let the world know that our success is due to God's blessing. Praise and thanksgiving need to go public. I've never known much about cars. 
While other boys had their heads under the car tinkering on the engine, I was off somewhere playing baseball or basketball or something. I know where to put the key. And I know which pedal I got to push to make it go. But that's about the extent of my mechanical prowess. When it comes to automobiles, I'm ignorant. But understand a vital point. Even though I might be ignorant, that doesn't mean I like to admit it. No, no, no. Engines in Greece are macho stuff. A man needs to know his way around the engine block. No self-respecting man wants to be known as mechanically illiterate. I'll never forget the day I was exposed. It was so humiliating. Right after my sweet wife and I had gotten married, we made a trip to North Lake Mall. We were just about to leave when the car wouldn't start. So I popped the hood. Now, don't misunderstand. It wasn't because I was going to try to fix anything. I just heard that when your car doesn't start, that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to pop the hood. But then a horrible thing happened. Two guys walked over to help me. I couldn't let them know how inept I was. So I grabbed a screwdriver, and I just started slapping stuff, you know, underneath the hood. Sticking my hand down in there, just acting like I knew what I was doing. Pretending, you know, pretending that I knew. Well, I didn't think it could get any worse. Oh, boy, but it did. For all of a sudden, my sweet newlywed wife, she gets out of the car. She walks right around in front of these two grown men. She takes the screwdriver out of my hand and decides to play Mrs. Goodwrench. Right there in broad daylight, she proceeds to fix the car all by herself. I was humiliated. My wife knew more about cars than I did. And now two other men in this world had seen the evidence. I should have been thankful. In fact, later that night, I did thank Kathy privately. But publicly, in that moment, I was so embarrassed. And this is the problem that some people have in their relationship with God. Oh, privately, they'll thank God. But publicly, they would rather everyone else think that they did it themselves. See, humans don't like broadcasting to others their ineptitude and their dependence. Why is that? Why is it so hard for us to admit our weaknesses? Hey, and none of us are truly independent and self-sufficient people. You know, there's no such thing as a self-made man or a self-made woman. Hey, on the day you were born, you already owed somebody nine months room and board. (laughs) Psalm 100 verse 3 tells us we all owe God. It is He who has made us and not we ourselves. We depend on God for the air we breathe and for our next breath. Why is it so hard for us to be honest about our dependence on God and go public with our praise? I'll tell you the problem. It's pride. It's pride. You see, pride slays thanksgiving. A proud person hates to say thanks. For if they do, it shatters the illusion that they're in control, that they've got it all together. You see, gratitude is the admission that I have a need that I can't meet. And we've all got those needs. Who's fooling who? It's so freeing to just drop the facade and be grateful. The tribes of East Africa, they have unusual ways to say thank you. The Maasai tribe of Kenya, they'll bow their heads to the ground and they'll say, my head is in the dirt. It means thank you. Members from another tribe, they sit on the ground for a long time before the hut of the person to whom they're thankful. They say, I sit on the ground before you. You see, these Africans understand a truth that makes gratitude so difficult for us. They realize that true thanksgiving is first and foremost an act of humility. The psalmist contends that we're not really grateful. We're not grateful to God unless we're willing to lay aside our pride and go public with our praise. See, true thanksgiving won't be intimidated by the sneers or the scowls or the slights of other people. It'll rise up 
even when looked down on. Robert Walpole was Britain's first prime minister. But his administration fell because he was betrayed by former friends who had voted him out of office. Walpole sat in the House of Commons the day the members cast the vote to bring down his government. One by one, his opponents, they stepped up to cast their votes. As each man man passed by, Walpole commented to a reporter sitting next to him. He said, that fellow I saved from the gallows. And that one over there, I saved him and his family from starvation. And I promoted that man's son to an office in my government. You see, on and on the stories went. Each parliament member that day who voted against Walpole had a reason to be thankful to him. But rather than express their gratitude, they buckled under to political pressures, to the opinions of others, to the people in whom they wanted to court favor. Those parliament members lacked the courage to say thanks. And sometimes that's what it takes. When it comes to our relationship with God, don't ever let it be said of you that you buckled under to political pressures, that you cowered away from giving your great God the glory he deserved. Sometimes it takes guts to show gratitude. Don't just praise God in the safety of your church or in the quiet of your home. Be courageous and go public with your praise and thanksgiving. Let me close this morning with the story of a man who found the barn where Satan stores his seeds. He looked in this barn and there were seeds of discouragement and doubt and fear and lust and greed and guilt. It frightened him to hear Satan boasting about how his seeds would take root in almost any type of soil. The man questioned him, are you sure they'll grow in any soil? That's when Satan had to backtrack. He reluctantly admitted, he said, well, there is one place I can never get them to grow, and that's in the heart of a grateful person. Oh, how we need to be thankful people. And how do we say thanks to God for all his benefits towards us? The psalmist speaks of three ways. Take up the cup of salvation Enjoy every single blessing that the blood of Jesus has purchased for you. Call upon the name of the Lord. In times of trouble, run, race to your heavenly Father for help and pray. Pay your vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Go public with your praise. And do it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for this church, their readiness to hear, their eagerness to obey. Now, Lord, help us to be not just hearers of your word, but doers. Lord, help us to go public with our praise and let this world know of our great God and what he's done. Lord, help us to run to you in times of trouble. Rather than trying to sort it out and work on it ourselves, Lord, may we take our needs to you. You're a good, good father. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to take up the cup of salvation and savor every single drop. Lord, just enjoy every single blessing that you have for us. You are a good father, and you delight in giving good gifts to your kids. The least we can do, Lord, and really all that you ask is for us to be thankful. Help us, Lord, to be grateful people. We pray it and ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Great, great, great. Let's all stand. Well, may the Lord bless you today and all week long, and especially on Thursday. How many of you have been bringing ponies over for your grandbabies? (laughs) I'm the only one. After the first service, somebody came up to me and said, you know what? I was told that I'm supposed to take care of my grandbabies for Thanksgiving, and I'm going to go out and get ponies this week. (laughs) Maybe I'm starting a trend. Well, I hope you have a great week, and, and I hope that you, you are known among your friends, among your acquaintances, among people at work. I hope you're known as a grateful person. 
We have a great God. And we should be grateful for all his blessings. Well, if you need special prayer this morning, I'm going to be here in the altar. I'll be happy to meet with you and pray with you. I would imagine that the person next to you would probably be willing to pray for you if you just asked them. You can just turn and put your arm around them and say, would you pray for me? I, I need some prayer this morning. I'll bet they would. God bless you. I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful week.